talk with uh, Ken after yesterday, I think there's a lot of conversation we can do exchanging ideas with the theaters and maybe a, a designated Q&A. This is what the kind of the panel discussion is for. Um, and we have Ken Stein and Diana and Jane Devil, uh, three of them are here, so happy to answer any questions related to tax credit or theaters, of course, in general. And we have many theater groups still here today. Um, I'm gonna hand the microphone to Ken to start. Thank you. So, I don't know that we're better than better, but I'm gonna go with we're pretty good. Um, Real quick, how about we introduce ourselves and then we'll start. So, my name is Ken Stein. If you were here yesterday, I spoke. I am the president and CEO for the League of Historic American Theaters, uh, which means I work with about 400 historic theaters around the nation. In the course of my career, I've worked probably with closer to a thousand of those historic theaters. Another shout out to Conrad Smith, one of our sponsors, so I'm so glad to see them here. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, um, uh, when we heard that there, someone wasn't able to, so we're sorry that Nikolai couldn't be with us, but um, uh, uh, we, we've, so we've been asked to sort of fill in. Um, so let me let you know who else is up for with me and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a discussion and take questions. So good afternoon, I'm Diana Pinkunis, I'm the State Historic Preservation Officer and the State Historic Preservation Office administers the State and National Register Program and the State and National, um, the State and Federal Tax Credits for Rehabilitation of Historic Buildings. We also maintain an extensive database where you can look up your historic theater, see perhaps if it's listed already and if you would then make a good candidate. Um, and we also administer the Certified Local Government Program and so there is funding available through the Certified Local Government um, Program for nominations. So if you have a historic theater, you're in a Certified Local Government, it's an eligible theater, you could talk to your community to see if they would like to submit for a subgrant for that nomination. Hi, my name is Jen Dable, and I am heading up the Midwest Office for Heritage Consulting Group. So we are a consulting firm and we will help you uh, get your building listed if it's not listed yet or we'll assist you with the tax credit application process. Um, but I am a preservation architect as well and uh, I used to work for Dinah. So I, uh, I can at least pretend I know stuff. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan Beck, and uh, I'm just uh, grabbing my seat. And, uh, I'm a real estate developer with uh, 20 years of experience as a uh, tax credit investor consultant and uh, historic preservationist. All around good guy. And as I said, comedian. Yes. <laughs> Um, let me ask you something. How much of you, how many of you are more excited to be here at Taliesin for this conference than if it were, say, in the ballroom of a Holiday Inn someplace? Right? Okay. The power of space. That's why we're all here. Um, but it, this is interesting because we're here about historic theaters, which always is a, when I'm with preservationists, I always have to remind them, it's, it's slightly different because if you restore an old house, you don't then go to conferences to talk to other people about how you're going to live in that house, right? You live in your house. Or if you restore an old building and you're going to use it for your office, let's say you're an insurance company, you might go to a conference about, you know, insurance, but they're not going to talk to you about how you restored your building. When you restore an old theater, a historic theater, you're restoring it for the public, and you're suddenly now part, part of the arts and entertainment world, and so you have to know, well, now how do, how do I run a theater, despite the fact that it's a historic theater, how do I run a theater, how do I... Because a, 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 an empty historic theater is a deteriorating building, it's just plain and simple. If, if you're not actively using it for something, it doesn't matter how beautiful the restoration work, eventually that's all going to start declining again. So, um, so... I can speak to those of you that are actually working on or are actively operating a historic theater, but the group up here, hopefully any questions you might have, whether it's preservation or funding or operations, 
or um, anything like that, we can hopefully get an answer for you. Um, but I just wanted to start with, yesterday we heard some presentations from some of the beautiful theaters around Wisconsin, and somebody had an issue about um, insurance. Their insurance had gone away. And so the great thing about gatherings like this is usually somebody knows something. And in this case, I was able to say, I don't know if you know this, but the National Trust has an insurance program. And to work with an insurance company that understands that you have a historic building uh, or that you have a historic theater, that's really great. And I can tell you of the hundreds of historic theaters that I know that had used that insurance program, uh, they say working with someone who understood that they had a historic building not only made for better customer service, but they also tell us that they got a better price too. So, so those are the type of questions that you can ask. Someone up here is gonna know. So I, I throw that out only because I'm, I'm sure you didn't come to this thinking that someone was gonna be able to give you advice on where to go get your insurance. But, so no question is stupid is, is where, where I'm going with this. Yes? Um, the National Trust Insurance Services Program, which is uh, a collaboration between Maury Dalian Park Insurance and the National Trust for Historic Preservation covers all historic properties. Thank you. So you can go to them for anything. But I would also like to point out to people who just any type of listed resource. So if your insurance agent is telling you that because you have a listed property, your insurance should be higher, that is incorrect. Listing in the National Register does not require you to rebuild a building that has been lost. It does not require you to restore it. So that is a very important thing to know if you are dealing with an insurance agent and they say, oh, your house is listed, your insurance is going up. Unless you are interested in that kind of replacement insurance or that very high level of insurance um, that you could restore a property to that degree, that is not a requirement of the National Register program. And I actually should say, the National Trust Insurance Services Program would tell you exactly that. In other words, I, I'm not telling you to go to them because they have a special thing for insurance. They actually understand what you need as a historic property. So if, 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 I, if I misspoke, yeah. And they will work with your local broker if that's what you need them to do. Because in some cases we're dealing with a, a, a relationship in the community that we can't break, right? So, Okay, so um, so at this point, show of hands, what kind of questions do we have? Otherwise, we're going to just, you know, pass the mic up here and tell jokes. Yes? Actually, um, I have a kind of a, a thought more than a question. It's probably a little geared more towards Wisconsin specifically. I know one of the issues that the brand in London has had and some of the other theaters may have had this as well, is dealing with a building inspector that does not understand historic buildings. And will come in and very quickly condemn a building, padlock the front doors, which is what happened at the Grand, just as they were getting the fundraising and the referendum, some of the bricks delaminated and came off and they padlocked the doors. How do we deal with our building inspectors in our communities that have no real understanding of historic buildings and look at it and immediately say, oh, that's blank, shut it down. Is there any way we can advocate to get historic preservation in some of their training somewhere, so at least they have that awareness of it. Oh, sorry! <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to ask the alderman here from Green Bay, Mark. Do you want to come join us? <laughs> He's also better it's than better. the best. <laughs> Hi, everybody. First of all, this is a phenomenal conference. Um, so I love historical preservation, but I'm also on city council in Green Bay. So I've been there for nine years. And one of the things that we deal with, we deal with inspectors, other departments all the time. We have citizens that call us and, hey, fix this, do this, do that. 
And for example, in Green Bay, it took us 30 years, last 30 years to get a certified local government status. It took a long time, but we have it. And one thing with inspectors, you know, they, they have a lot of conditions, a lot of things, everything from rats, rat sidings to bad windows to, uh, you know, just deteriorating properties. And what I've found is that as an alderman, I do talk with our inspection department a lot and tell them some of the issues that the public is dealing with and just to inform them. And a lot of times they're very happy to hear that that you know that there are issues out there and that we can help in that way so I'm not saying it's a perfect system but for myself I try to communicate with with our inspectors as an alderman and uh, let them know that there's concerns by the citizens and if nothing else talk to the mayor as well and just let them let them know that but and they're not gonna know everything there's no way that they can know everything because with these new ordinances that come on board, there are many, many that you have to study and look at, and they have to try to keep up with it. So it's a challenge for the inspectors, but don't give up on them. I just say, you know, communicate with them, talk to them, and like I said, I've, I've had good luck with them in Green Bay, so that's my story. Thank you. Um, and what I will say is attending things like this. So the, the League of Historic American Theaters, the whole premise behind that when it was formed 45 years ago was someone else has probably already run into that problem. So don't reinvent the wheel. So it's staying in contact with other theaters, historic theaters in Wisconsin and being able to pick up a call and say, hey, I've got an issue. I've got an inspector that's closing us down. Has anyone dealt with that before? So just that type of networking. I, I, I mean, I, I opened with this and I'm gonna say it again. His, historic buildings are all historic, but historic theaters, suddenly you've got a great little, you know, subset that have a lot of things in common. And so y'all now all met one another at this conference. You should probably plan on getting together every couple of months and just sharing your stories and sharing your challenges. Got a question back here? It's actually a comment um, in response. So I think it's like working with any other government uh, unit on anything. Be proactive. You're going to start that campaign. You're going to start the fundraising campaign. Get your local governments involved. Let them know what you're doing. Let them know what your plans are. Because there's going to be a problem. Something's going to fall down. And of course, we don't want anybody to get injured or killed, and that's what the building inspector is concerned with, which is why he or she'll padlock that door. But if you have started proactively to say, here's what we're doing, here's what our plan is, we're at the stage. When something happens, what I've found is that people will work with you. They'll say, okay, and especially if you know something's vulnerable and you have a risk mitigation plan ready to go. So this part of the building is weak. You know that there's a, a problem here. If something happens here, here's how we're sectioning that off, or whatever it is. They'll work with you. They don't, in my experience, no one wants to shut the building down. No one wants to cut off your campaign. So the more proactive you are in managing those relationships, the more cooperation you'll have. And a good example I'll take from our property out in, in Arizona, Talies and West. We have a kitchen. That kitchen needs a commercial license. That kitchen has, like the buildings here, stone walls, all kinds of porous surfaces that will never, ever, ever meet building code. It's certainly not health code. We don't have electrical that's in building code because those are solid stone walls. You can't run conduit through it. You can't run pipes through it. I mean, it's one thing after another that's out of building code. But by engaging with the city of Scottsdale, with Maricopa County, and engaging with the state, about our UNESCO World Heritage Site, the National Historic Landmark, and doing that over years. When we went to get the kitchen license, they said, okay, well, we understand you can't change this and make it according to our code, but let's see what we can do together to really minimize the risks, and we'll sort of look at the spirit, if not the letter of the law, even on a health code issue. We, had to make, we thought we were gonna have to make a couple of hundred thousand dollars in changes, Less than $50,000, up and running, commercial license on the kitchen until the pandemic started. Everybody was very happy. So, you know, I think it's, I was a lawyer before I, I, I 
just go down the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. This is what I would tell clients all along, and it's just like this. Just get out ahead of the problem. If you have the relationship, and if they know what your intentions are, and the good you're trying to do, they'll work with you, every time. Yeah, I found that to be true, too. Question in the back? I just have a quick Comment? ad. I have a quick ad to be mad. <laughs> Sorry. See how well this is working? I know, right? We're all here. We're all under the same tent. So, no, to add, to add to the ad, so it's very rare that you will actually have someone come and padlock a door without getting some form of notification first to tell you to fix that problem. And so then what we do is we reply saying, like, we just had a project in Milwaukee a few years ago where we had some industrial steel sash windows that were so corroded they were blowing out. And they had an order from the city of Milwaukee to like, you need to repair these ASAP or we're gonna shut down your building and you will lose your occupancy. So we got back to them and said, hey, we're doing a window condition survey, give us some time, we'll put some board up over the worst windows and, and then we'll get back to you. And they were fine with that. And they released the whole, the, you know, the, um, the order from the building to do the work. And then we got back to them and worked out a plan. And it wasn't until four years later that those windows were fixed. But because we kept that communication going and let them know what process we were at with drawings, bidding, scope, all of that stuff, and they were in with the architect on design review, they knew what was going on and it was fine. So that's my end. <laughs> I also just want to mention that the state of Wisconsin adopted the International Building Code and also the International Existing <laughs> Building Code. And the IEBC is what we call it. There's a chapter in there for historic buildings. And so if you do have a building that's listed, contributing in a district, or even if it's just certified historic, um, which could be a local designation, you can use a special chapter in the IEBC, which will, will allow for certain things like maybe your railing doesn't go up 48 inches. Maybe it's only 30 inches, and so that's okay. So I, I would recommend that you look at the IEBC too. So the question is, what about ADA compliance and when you're dealing with a historic property, what kind of exceptions are there do you have to? Sure. State of Wisconsin has a dispro disproportionality code, which essentially says, and there's a myth, they say, well, I don't want to fix this building because they're going to make me put an elevator in it. Okay. Well, the state of Wisconsin has disproportionality, so they're going to ask you that you put 20% of your overall budget into improving accessibility for the building. And so if you have a project that's only $50,000, they're not going to make you install an elevator because that's disproportionate to the overall budget, right? And so, and then the other thing they do is they have you start at the exterior and work your way in. And so um, they're going to say, do you have an accessible parking spot? If not, that's where your money goes first. Do you have an accessible route into the building? You, then you're going to move there. Do you have an accessible entry? So you work your way through that way as well. And so the whole idea is that after the project, whether it's 50,000 or 2 million, your building is a little bit better on accessibility than it was before the project. Yeah, so this is a very particular situation. It is an observation tower, it's not a building. And so actually our office is working with the DNR because that has come in and we, we would be reviewing any changes to that tower. And um, I can tell you that the DNR is looking if there are other solutions um, to, to achieve the intent. Got another question? So far y'all haven't stumped us. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I'm a material person, but since I work in a lot of historic theaters, I can only help them out with those aspects. But 
one thing I continually see, especially theaters in small communities, is that they have a hard time figuring out how to maintain a sustainable business and how they serve their community the best. And if there's resources available to those theaters to help them try to figure out what maybe would work best for them. Yeah, your business plan can't be, if we build it, they will come. Yes. Um, so for those of y'all that didn't hear from the back there, what he was saying is, is when you're dealing with a historic theater, is there, is, are there resources for them having a business plan in place that then keeps you sustainable and operational going forward? Um, I'm going to be self-serving here. That's 95% of what the League of Historic American Theaters does. Is we, we bring historic theaters together to share best practices. Um, and But I don't want to go any farther because I don't want to sound like a commercial. But does anyone either have anything to add to that? Or how many of you are actually operating a historic theater or you have a historic theater that you're trying to get the doors open oh, nice. is, is, I find that fascinating um, just because well I just find it I'm sorry I find it fascinating because I love that preservationists show up to anything about preservation I love that about y'all <laughs> you didn't have to have a historic theater to come to this conference about historic theaters because it also was dealing with preservation. Okay, so um, I, I was just, that was just me curious how many of y'all are here. So do we have any other questions or comments? Otherwise, we're just going to like give you our greatest hits. I'm going to give you mine and then I'm going to pass. Yes? Are there yes. any potential seed funny? Can't Potential work. state funding. Seed money for projects. Seed, seed money. Money. For projects that are yeah, that's the number one question I get in my organization. Yeah. Um, the answer is yes and no. It depends on the community you're in and the project you're working on and what you're hoping to do with it. Um, you know whether you qualify for something as extraordinary as what's happening here, where you've got you know an America's Treasures grant, or whether it's it's something specific to your community. I'm in Austin. If you have a property on Congress Avenue in Austin, you have access to money that somebody who has a historic property not on Congress Avenue has to. So the funding is pretty specific to the project. Does anyone want to add? Yeah, so I'm sure most of you know about this. We've been talking about the state and federal tax credits that are available um, by working with our office. There are the Save America's Treasures grants, but again, only for national historic landmarks. But, um, and actually, there's Mark back there, um, that the Park Service now too has, there is uh, bricks and mortar money for properties associated with civil rights. Um, so it's sometimes just finding the where you fit in, and as we know that there are a number of arts organizations in Wisconsin, you really have to look locally too to see some funding is very specific to a county or a particular property type or a particular goal. And we do have a funding information um, section on the Wisconsin Historical Society website, so you can kind of see sometimes it's maybe not fully funding for your bricks and mortar, but maybe there's more funding for. Um, supporting some type of programming. So if you can get money for your programming, then you could use your money for a new roof. To, to Donna's point about where do we start. Or for, for tax credits. Yeah. Tax credits, tax credits, tax credits. Yeah, I would say the only other thing would be the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Uh, they had 250000 for the West Bend Theater. Um, and they work with the local community and then that community works with the theater organization, but that's the type of projects that they actually would like to see. So I think, you know, that's my only other idea for a state resource that is tax credit for them. Yep, maybe Main Street funding too, if they're in Main Street district. Yes, so this might be an Eileen and Tony question, but I'm always curious when I see restoration of decorative features or murals that have darkened over time. How much of that is the degradation of the finishes itself, or how much of that is related to like smoking in the lobby and decades of smoke breaks in the lobby? Well, the good news is, is Eileen and Tony are still here, I think, right? Oh. <laughs> what was that famous um, Emmy Award show where she was in the bathroom and they told her she won? Um, Tony! <laughs> <laughs> Tony, the question is: Is when we're when we're looking at 
finishes on a, in this case, a historic theater, and there's a, a lot of degradation and grime and everything. How much of that is time, and how much of that is, hey, they were smoking in here for years? It's really hard to tell. I mean, every situation is different, and it's just, you know, really the, the key then comes after. I mean, obviously we try to preserve original finishes as often as we can. I will tell you from my experience, in theaters it's probably, it happens less than other environments like let's say a historic house museum or uh, you know, a church. For some reason it's just to make it cohesive looking because it has to stay as an operating building. The general census is always to replicate. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose this as a slightly different question. How far can you get on just cleaning? You can get really far sometimes. You can get really far is the answer. You can get really far. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. No, that, <laughs> no I just, because I think sort of that was part of what you were asking. Anyone else? Yeah. Have... Yes, Stuart. Jump back quickly to the, the previous question. Another source of grants that I'd look at for the historic theater is anything around the concept of creative placemaking. People here familiar with creative placemaking? Some people are nodding. If not, Google it. There's a lot of information out there. But the Arts Pound grants through the National Endowment for the Arts, Art Place um, has uh, a consortium of government funders, private funders, the Pesky Foundation. They will work with city governments, with local initiatives, with uh, owners of historic buildings, with and always a cultural arts organization for creative placemaking. And just as an example, the NEA Our Town Grant in the current cycle is up to $150,000, uh, some of which can be used for brick and mortar, some of which is programmatic. But it's just another way of looking at it, and it's a great way to engage the partners in your community who are looking at economic development opportunities because it is this integration of economic development and art and culture. So, great opportunity there. I just want to add to that, uh, if you have a theater, consider partnering with a contemporary performing artist since you have the space and they're looking for the audience. You can do a 50-50 fundraiser or something along that line where 50% of the money goes to the building and restoration and 50 when you go to the artist, but consider contemporary performing artists because they probably love the opportunity to have a theater space to perform. I was about to say, I know there's a fundraising consultant in the house. There he is back there. <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I think generally these are all good ideas. Um, I don't know if the placemaking aspect is still around. Um, uh, it's kind of, I think, weighing a little bit in terms of funders and what the priorities are. A lot of connections to the racial equity work, bringing more people into your mission and the work of your organization is really great. Specifically to the capital fundraising, um, National Endowment for the Humanities has some really great infrastructure capacity building grants, up to three quarters of a million dollars. Um, for NEH and NEA, I mean, they're sister agencies, but the NEH tends to go more towards the bricks and mortar, while the NEA more towards uh, goes more towards the um, programmatic type brands. But anything that has to do with presenting art, um, I think is NEA related. NEH is more um, how it's mounted, how it's sort of presented in a way that uh, is really meaningful to the community. So a really great resource to look into in terms of the fodder for your, your grant applications would be your national register listings. If it's in a district, like what types of people came into uh, your town historically. But also I think it really gets back to what types of people are you seeking to engage. Um, and that's where you can really, I think, um, leverage your, your NEA, NEH funding, but also with your private foundations as well. So. Okay, and so I'm always looking at this through historic theater eyes. So I'm going to broaden your scope here because I'm, I'm not going to take anything away from grants and NEA and all of those incredible programs. They're highly competitive. It takes a long time to write that grant and work your way through the process, and then you may end up getting denied. denied. So I'm not saying don't do it. If you get approved, that's a big pot of money that you can end up with. But you've got a historic theater. So the theater I was talking about yesterday, you know who the largest donor was to that theater early on when they were trying to restore it? Mike and Betsy Cogburn, who had their first date at the theater. And Mike told us that it was a double feature of James Bond 
and he remembers the first one was from Russia with love, but he can't remember the second one because he was too busy staring at Betsy and falling in love. And Betsy told us, no, 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 that's not true. I had a curfew and he had to get me home, so we had to leave. <laughs> Mike and Betsy Cogburn wrote the, the first $250,000 check to start off that restoration. So keep that in mind too. You have a historic theater that is filled with memories in your community. So individual giving is probably where you're gonna have the most quivers, or the most arrows in your in your quiver to get out there and raise some funds. Not taking away from any of the other things you just heard. It's all part of a larger pool of funding. Yes? I was gonna say 80% of all fundraising is individual giving. 20% is uh, like state or federal or local funding. Does anyone want to give any more Wisconsin specific? Okay. Do we have any other questions? <laughs> the question is, is there a definition of a historic theater? Does it have to be 50 years old? Which is funny that you said that. So, I don't know what the definition of a historic theater is, I just know what one looks like, right? Isn't that the comment? Um, for my organization, we don't require you to be registered or plaqued or any of that. If you're 50 years or older and someone in your community doesn't want you to go away, we welcome you into the League of Historic American Theaters. We feel it's more about what you mean to the community you're in as opposed to who built you or what plaque is hanging outside. That that said, I know there are lots of requirements when you're going for, well, National Registry, National Landmark, all those different, and then there are state registries and county registries and all that good stuff. Does anyone want to give a better definition of historic? Right, if you're thinking of the broad historic theater, definitely go with that definition. If it's the National Register, right, we do have the sort of 50-year guidance that we look at, so it just depends on how you're viewing it. Yeah. We have a member that we refer to as the historic theater of the future because they're not quite 50 years old, but it's a very particular building that we were like, sure, we'd love to have them come join us. Any other comments? Otherwise, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, oh. We have filled our time! <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and this is an instance of contingency like the trust really handles today. Uh, and that's because we have people, awesome people like them, to support us, to meet up last minute requests, to put up a panel together. So I really appreciate everybody here. I'm going to give a round of applause for our show. Thank you so much.